Hey, good evening, MVKBA, everyone out in the family that we have right now tonight. I want to give you a special welcome to John Odenkirk as we get kicked off for tonight's meeting that we're going to have on the, the current bass populations in Northern Virginia. John, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jim. Happy to be here, man. Roger that. Thank you again. And I give everyone a heads up tonight. We're going to get presentations. The, the connection may be a little slow. We have a little bit of a delay. We're trying to make do. That's why we got started about two minutes late so we could get it uploaded, but we should be good to go. So, uh, John, for those who are joining us or are going to be watching later on, do me a favor, go ahead and give a brief introduction, your background, creds, and then uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight. We'll go ahead and get started. Yeah, sure. Thanks again, Jim. So, uh, some of y'all know me, some of y'all maybe not. My name is John Odenkirk. I'm a fisheries biologist for. When I started with the outfit, it was called the Commission of Game and Inland Fisheries. Then it was the Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. And now we're a Department of Wildlife Resources because we're holistic and we take care of all the wildlife, not just the bass and the trout and the white-tailed deer, but all of it as legislated by law. Um, so I cover the Northern Virginia District, which is about 10 counties from Lake Anna all the way up to Northern Virginia and then as far west as Skyline Drive. So I've got quite a diversity. You know, I go from wild trout to tidewater, uh, which is nice for me because it breaks things up a little bit. And I get to do a lot of different things. Mm, I've been working this area for a while. I've got the tidal tributary, to the Potomac River tributaries. Since Potomac's technically Maryland's river. Um, but I do manage the tributaries on the Virginia side. I manage the Rappahannock as far down as Port Royal, Lake Anna, which I see indicated. And then all the small lakes scattered throughout like the Aquaquan Reservoir at all. Um, so if you all have questions after tonight and you want to reach me, I'm pretty accessible. Um, my phone number's sitting on this first slide that you'll see in a minute. My email address is on that first slide. And um, this, sorry, it doesn't say uh, kayak fishers. This, I just gave this talk two nights ago in Fredericksburg to a group called the Falmouth Flats Fly Fishers. And I started off with this gargantuan blue catfish, which is obviously not called in a fly rod because um, I don't fly fish and I like, you know, poking a little fun now and then. But anyway, I, I think that's probably enough of an intro for me. I, I got an undergrad at Virginia Tech in fisheries. I got a master's in Tennessee. Um, I spent some years with the feds in Florida before I came back to Virginia where I'm a homeboy here. So that's that's all about me now. So um, thank you for uh, entertaining me. <laughs> That's, that's definitely quite the introduction. So, John, you know, the first question I asked you the, the very first time that we did an interview. Hey, what's going on, Scylla? By the way, we got comments coming from Scylla Johnson in the, uh, out in the, uh, in the audience right now. She said, welcome, John, and howdy, Jim. Hey, howdy back to you. Uh, I know that uh, we're all very familiar with Scylla. She's definitely an incredible angler and, and uh, a great uh, contribution for MVKBA. John, the, one of the first questions that I had for you whenever we first discussed this um, I think it was probably about what two years ago, if I remember correctly, was uh, what's your favorite? What's your preference? And I'm going to keep asking you because I would definitely want to get an answer. And that's going to be bass or snakehead. <laughs> preference for what? I'll leave that open to interpretation. <laughs> well, they're both non native, they each have their own attributes. And I can't really tell you what my favorite would be because if somebody, if it would get back to somebody, then I might be in a little trouble. So I'm going to say I can't, <laughs> select, I can't pick a favorite here. Um, I, I have to manage the resources in my work area. So I'm going to leave it at that. I understand. I understand. Good answer. Very political. Very, very political. I love that. Uh, I, I definitely, uh, I, I'm going to touch on one of the comments that Silla left. She goes, uh, the, she said, eating, eating is snakehead for, for him. I understand eating snakehead is uh, probably going to be your preference. And I think I definitely agree. Snakehead is a pretty good, pretty tasty fish. Uh, fish in the DMV podcast commented, the dude is a legend. That's why we call him the snakehead whisperer. That's why he is, you know, John, the man Odenkirk. So, all right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and order. We're going to add our slides to this page. I know when you can go ahead and see everything. Okay. Good. Yeah, I can see that fine. Thank you, Jim. So yeah, just let that let that ride there for a minute. And um, for those of you out there, as I indicated, that's my cell phone number and my email address. And and don't uh, you know hesitate to contact me, reach out for whatever reason. I'm I'm very accessible. I'm fond of saying I'm never working and I'm always working. 
uh, which both of those things are true. So uh, you, you can reach out to me whenever you want. If I don't immediately respond, it's because I'm probably got my hands in, in some fish and, and uh, I'll get back to you pretty quick. So um, can move on to the next slide, I guess, at some point there, Jim. Thank you. <clears throat> So what I wanted to do with this initial um, talk, with, or with this initial couple slides here, there, there's been so much um, media attention, in some cases actually more than snakeheads on blue catfish and, and what blue catfish may or may not be doing in the tidal tributaries to the bay. And I just thought it was, especially for the group, as I mentioned, I just gave this talk to the Rappahannock fly anglers and, and of course this is a little bit more near and dear to their heart than maybe some of some of you all but um i thought it was important enough to point this out that you know we stocked blue cats when i say we i mean my agency stocked blue catfish in the mid 70s and, and you know the mid 70s I mean, that's a half a century ago i mean <laughs> it doesn't really necessarily seem like it but you know that's a long time and, and, and i'm not trying to justify anything i'm just saying that Back in those days and prior to that, fisheries management, a lot of it was just throwing some fish in a, a water body and seeing what happened. In fact, that's how we ended up with almost all the fish we have today uh, on the eastern side of Virginia, like largemouth and smallmouth and crappie, and red ear, bluegill, red breast. I mean, just take your pick. That's None of that stuff's native. It was put on rail cars and it was moved around the country by the federal government and some state agencies. Uh, and then just whatever water body they came to, they just threw the crap out and said, hey, let's see what happens. And, and, and that's how fisheries management worked for years. And so there was still a lot of, that, you know, old school men mentality in the 70s when a couple of people that worked for the Commission of Inland Fisheries at the time said, hey, you know, let's 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 get a trophy catfish fishery here in Virginia with these Mississippi River giants and throw some blue cats into the James and the Rappahannock and the York and see what happens. Well, it, it took a little bit, you know, for critical mass to occur, but it definitely did. I think part of the reason it took so long is because we're dealing with a long-lived species that attains a very large maximum weight, you know, maximum size, you know, you know, 150 plus pounds, 30 plus years um, longevity. So it took a while for sort of the blue cats to really, you know, make their mark. And of course they have now. And, and it's created some controversy and consternation. And then they've colonized the Potomac and a bunch of other Bay tributaries from illegal stockings. Um, but be that as it may, what I guess we felt somewhat obliged to, to at least look into this because there was there was so much outcry about the blue catfish is destroying this or that sort of like the snakehead thing, but maybe even more. And, and um, even early on, Virginia Commonwealth University, Greg Garman. They did a study. This was back, uh, wow, in the 90s. And, and one of the first dietary studies of blue catfish determined that the, the highest, uh, the, the, the most prevalent food items in blue catfish diet were gizzard chad and white perch. Well, we, we just spent, um, <laughs> we spent almost three quarters of a million dollars in five years with Joe Schmidt we call him Catfish Joey at Virginia Tech, doing a PhD and a bunch of master's students under him to basically find out the exact same thing. Um, they're eating gizzard chad and white perch. Their diets change, you know, from river system to river system. And they're opportunists, so they're going to eat what's there. And they do go down into the mesohaline sections of the, the bay system, which is the ones that start to get higher salinity. And there are blue crabs there, and they do eat some blue crabs. So I'm not going to say they're not eating any blue crabs, but... Um, they're not any of the allocenes. The allocenes is that group of fish, the shad and herring that migrate from the sea to the freshwater to spawn, like American shad, hickory shad, ALY, bluebacks. And that's why Embry Dam got blown up. That's why we're spending millions of dollars to create fish passage opportunities for these, these lame-ass fish to get their ass above the fall lines and the, to the traditional spawning areas. They're, they're really weak migrants. I mean, they could learn a thing or two from snakeheads for sure. Um, but and, and, and the bottom line is a lot of our efforts have really bared no fruit to this point. You know, American shad stocks are still dreadfully low. River herring stocks are way low. Hickory shad is about the only thing we got going for us. But the problem's not blue cats. It's offshore internet intercept fisheries, you know, in the international waters. They're getting they're getting haul sand by, uh, you know, factory ships. Uh, so 
anyway, um, it's not the Blue Cats, but okay, go ahead. Next slide, Jim. Um, just wanted to uh, jump in away from Blue Cats for a minute to Northern Virginia, to Burke Lake. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we, we had a huge muskie population in Burke Lake for many decades, and then they took a bit of a hit. Uh, we changed our broodstock collection for years. Burke Lake supplied the entire muskie brood progeny for the entire state stocking program. Um, which was kind of weird and unusual because you don't think of, you know, Burke Lake and Fairfax County being musky habitat. But for whatever reason, they did quite well there. Now, they didn't naturally reproduce, but, you know, the females got large, the males got large, they got gravid. We picked them up, you know, in spawning condition, strip, sp strip spawn them right there on the banks, uh, took the eggs back, fertilized the eggs back to Front Royal Fish Cultural Station. And, and that, that fueled the program. Um, unfortunately, we had a change about oh, 10 years ago, maybe a little more, where, where we went a different direction for our, our brood source for musky stocking in the state. And because of that, we weren't using Burke anymore, and Burke lost its stature uh, as the source. And the good thing about being the source was no matter what happened every year, we got the first 700 fish off the top to put back in Burke because that's the source. You got to see the source. And when Burke lost its stature as the source, we, we started skipping Burke because it fell down in the priority rankings because we never got enough musky to satisfy all the biologist needs statewide. So there were always shuffling of priorities. And um, because of that, Burke was on the, the short end of the stick many times in the last 10 plus years. And the musky population pretty much crashed. And some of that might have been a little bit due to habitat changes in the watershed, more siltation, um, some differences in the thermocline and, and the temperature and oxygen profiles. But it was definitely a lot to spawning or the, the you know, lack of stocking from, you know, the, the lost its, its spawning stature. So um, the bottom line, though, the good news is that we've been getting some advanced fingerlings from other states and we're starting now to rebuild that population. So if you want it, this is a good time of year um, to be chucking massive. You talk about swim baits, Jim, this thing's you, you, we're, we're talking about, you know, believers and, you know, eight, nine inch balsa wood baits. Um, but it, you know, these fish are out there now. We, we've got a couple people that are hardcore. I don't want to call them cultists, but they are, they are all about Burke muskie and, and they're, they're telling me they're getting follows. They're getting hookups. So the fish are there. Um, not like it's probably never be like it was 20, 30 years ago, but the fish are there right now. So, um, I encourage you if, if you're in that neck of the woods and you want something a little different than a bass or a snakehead, well, snakeheads aren't very active now anyway. Um, you know, you could ch try chasing a muskie. It's the only place Sh Shenandoah river is also pretty good, but short of the Shenandoah river, this is going to be your, your best chance for a muskie anywhere near here. Um, anyway. Okay. Just real quick. So if we're talking about the size that is on average that you're going to catch when it comes to Brook Lake. What would you estimate that to be? Uh, the males, the males are usually running eight to twelve pounds, and the females, probably twenty to twenty-five pounds. We wow. see larger, larger of both, but they're really beautiful fish there. Fish of the was it ten thousand casts? No, no yeah, that's yeah. what they say. I think it might be a few less, but that's what they say. <laughs> Especially in your case, got it. Okay, so we're going over switching the snakeheads now, and uh, this is Jason Emmel. He's the uh, was the past president, I think, of the Virginia Bowfishers Association, and I, I think I might have mentioned this. But I'm not sure if you all have heard this or if, if any of these, you know, people on the call here are, are repeat listeners. Um, but the point I wanted to make with regards to our snakehead uh, sort of philosophy and management in the state, it, it's still legal to bowfish and legal to hook and line, and it's unlimited catch. Uh, it's commercial sale allowed. Essentially, it's wide open. It's a wild, wild west for snakeheads still, despite the fact that on the last regulation cycle, we had more public comments about northern snakeheads than any species of fish. And 100% of those public comments were conservation oriented, which I found pretty astounding. And to this point, um, it hasn't really seemed to impact our leadership. Um, so we find ourselves at a very unusual kind of nexus here because number one, our job is to make fishing good for you all. You buy our licenses, you're on the water. 
we work for you. So number one, fishing should be good. Number two, we're stewards of the resource. Okay, so as long as there's not something this illegitimate happening to the resource, then we should be good. And this is where we get into sort of a situation with the snakehead is so far we've seen nothing to suggest that there's any issue. Okay, we're not promoting them. It's illegal to move them, um, but we haven't seen a downside. Now, that they haven't been in a water yet like uh, Back Bay or somewhere where there might be a threatened or endangered sunfish. Uh, so there's still potentially a downside, which is why we don't, I guess, are, are somewhat reluctant to embrace the fish to an extent. But at some point, I think the body of evidence will be, it'll be incumbent upon management staff to recognize what our constituents are asking for. And in light of the data that have been collected, what the story is being told uh, in terms of, it, it, now, you know, I'm convinced at this point that there's, there's no way a snake is ever going to outcompete a largemouth bass. Um, so I'm not worried about bass at all. I mean, the, the, the one thing I mentioned about a, a threatened or endangered fish is pretty much the only thing um, that's kept me from basically stamping the snakehead as, you know, two thumbs up, R3, all over it. This is the best thing that's ever happened to freshwater fishing in Virginia. I can't say that um, because of certain unknowns. But um, I'd say the glass is more than half full from my perspective with regards to this fish. So, I am, yeah. We probably move on the next slide at that point. So, well, I, and I appreciate that, John. Let me let me back pedal for just one second. So, we did have a comment related to the last slide, which was uh, talking about the muskie, and this came from Scylla. She asked what the main forage was for muskie in Burke Lake, and then I'm going to move on to another question related to snakehead. Yep. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah, that's a good question. And Burke Lake. One of the reasons Burke Lake was so hard to bass fish is because there's so much forage in Burke Lake. The muskie there have an unbelievable buffet. Of, of options okay so depending on the time of the year i think the fish is going to transition a little bit that there are suckers in there which is sort of a classic musky favorite and it's, it's the more natural habitats you've got white suckers primarily in burke lake which get quite large uh, so i think that during the colder times of the year especially suckers tend to migrate up towards um, the tributaries and the head of the lake you know right now this time of year you've also got yellow perch in, in Burke Lake, um, which are spawning right now. And so that is an excellent forage for muskie to be hammering right now. So I think if you're trying to target muskie now, I'd be patterning something after a yellow perch or, or a sucker. But later in the year, when those fish stratify and they get kind of contained in that thermocline, base of the thermocline layer, which in Burke is about seven or eight feet down, they're gonna probably be looking at gizzard chad, um, you know, may, maybe some other sunfish species, like, like you know, there's, there's a, eight or ten different sunfish species in Burke Lake. Um, essentially, at that point, they're going to be relegated to an opportunist level, um, you know, whatever whatever's there in their habitat, because they're not going to want to leave that that layer of, of fairly cool oxygenated water at the base of the thermocline. So if you put something down there and they're hungry, they're going to eat it. And are, so if they are as voracious as, you know, the uh, conventional wisdom suggests because of their size and because of the mouthful of, uh, of uh, weapons that they have, is it going to be something that is going to be a moving bait? Is it something that uh, we, we know that we can throw that would be similar to what a bass would eat? Is it more about the action, cadence and rhythm, or is it about the uh, a completely different style of fishing? Or yeah, approach? I mean, that that's a good question for Jason Halliker. He's the biologist in the valley. That, that, that manages the Shenandoah River and is also an avid musky angler. He's got his own float boat, um, sort of like a guide setup boat. And um, that, I mean, if you really want to go after him, I could put you in touch with Jason and he'd give you more information on, on bait and terminal tactics because I, I've never fished for musky in my life. So I, I'd be kind of BSing you if I, I, I know that the people that fish for him are, it's, it's a very active thing, right? So, um, you know, but but yeah, that, that, that's all. Also, sure. No, no, no. By all means, and very valid answer. Very, very valid point. I appreciate you uh, letting us know so that way we can go ahead and post it for anyone who does have interest in it. Uh, real quick, coming out from Peter. You know what? I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name. He said, "Hey, hi, John. Tell us about the tidal smallmouth populations in the Potomac and the Rappahannock. I, I think this is probably going to be here after we get to the next slide deck. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's an interesting question. Did he specifically mean tidal smallmouth? Uh, bull run maybe uh okay because 
because because Todd you now now the interesting thing is and the reason I asked is because in the Rappahannock below Fredericksburg, in the title section, we rarely get smallmouth bass in our surveys. Once we, we get a few. I mean, we, for perspective, we might get a hundred largemouth in a day of sampling on the title Rappahannock. We might get three, four smallmouth. Okay, so nothing to speak of, but there are people that catch unbelievable smallmouth in the tidal Rappahannock around Massaponics, uh, where they, where Stafford County has their boat access, which is about three miles below Fredericksburg. That's tidewater, not what you think of as classic smallmouth bass habitat. And I wouldn't believe what this guy's telling me, except I've seen the pictures and it's been, you know, I've been verified by alternate sources. And, and this, this guy is catching fish. It looks like he's up in Lake Ontario. And these are like five to seven wow. pounds smallmouth, five what? to six pounds, not seven, five to six. They are just like stupid fat, like football shaped. And, and we never see them in our surveys. They're too deep. Um, but anyway, that, that's why you, you perked me up when you said that. Now, I, I don't know anything about small. I've never seen a smallmouth from the title Potomac. Um, you know, generally, you know, smallmouth are, are above the fall line in the non-tidal section of our major river systems. But but just that that one thing that I mentioned um, if, if you're really after a trophy pig smallmouth, go go put in at City Dock in Fredericksburg and run a couple miles down, or put in at Stafford County False Hill False Hill Plant and uh, fish right there, Massaponics about a half mile up, and and you might stumble into a, a trophy, you know, state record proportion smallmouth. Yeah, yeah, no, no, nobody put in there. Everybody go to ORP and fish there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, real quick. Uh, just a couple other uh, comments so I can touch up and, 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 and touch on these and keep uh, up with the cadence and rhythm that we have right now. Um, Jesus, we got a lot of comments coming in here. Uh, yep, seems to be more them between uh, Doc and Hop Yard, and this is coming in from uh, Peter. I'm, I'm going to take a, a guess because I do speak a little German because of my uh, my my time abroad. Fotenhauer, I hope that's right. P f o t e n h a u e r. So anyway, he said, "Yep, seem to be more of them between City Dock and Hop Yard." John's journey is above the fall line and the fall line on the Rappahannock is amazing for smallies. Peter coming back. Good to know it's verified. Scylla. Aquacorn Reservoir has smallmouth also. That is correct, Scylla. Uh, in fact, one of our NVKBA members, uh, Joel. Joel caught one himself. Uh, and I do believe Mike probably has as well. So uh, another DC rip wrap around bridges in the city. Question mark. John's journeys. Gotcha. Uh, Alabama, are the Alabama bass in the upper Rappahannock yet? We're going to get to that in just one second. And that's a comment coming from from fishing the DMV podcast, and then Peter's last comment. Uh, Jay, we yeah, we got it. Okay, so got it caught up on that. We're talking about uh, your last slide that you were just on was talking about snakehead. I think we're good to go. To snakehead, we can move forward. To, but I, I do want to ask one important question for those who want to have an impact and have direct impact at that for trying to be able to conserve our waterways when it comes to keeping snakehead, keeping them protected. I know we can't do that right now without official legislation in place, but uh, as you mentioned before, everything is pretty much relegated to word of mouth and just people, um, you know, a little bit of self-discipline. What can we do to help pass legislation to be able to protect our snakehead, uh, the, the species of fish, to keep them on our waterways, to keep their populations healthy moving forward? I think next year is going to be the next two-year cycle, right? Exactly. Yeah. Just You're just going to have to stick it out for the next year um, until the, the public comment thing rolls back around. And then, you know, just just do your diligence, you know, tell, tell us what you think. And that's, that's all we can, that's all we can do. And they can do that by going to, uh, uh, go outdoors. Uh, what is it? Dot gov. Dot org. VDWR. Gov. Dot gov. Okay. And, uh, next year. So, um, what we could try to do is try to keep up with this, post something to our MVKBA website and let everyone know. So that way we can try to get maximum input and uh, keep the species protected. So, all right, John, back over to you. Okay, Th this is just a sort of a line graph of, of the abundance of snakeheads. Just to sort of bring back, the, you know, what I already kind of alluded to with the shot with Jason. Um, on, on You'll see some of these in, in one of the other talks. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen um, a graph like this, CPUE is on the y-axis, and that is simply catch per unit effort. And that's how we measure the uh, relative abundance of fish from electrofishing. And so that's the number of fish that we caught per hour. And so you notice that the, that the maximum amount on the y-axis is only 12 fish an hour. 
which is an order of magnitude less than we would typically see for a mm -hmm. large amount of bass uh, CPUE slide. And what we see is when snakeheads first showed up in 2004, they colonized rapidly and they hit that peak in about 2013 or so. And then they declined <laughs> almost as rapidly as they, they, they showed up. So, um, and these are from my core creeks. I call the core creeks. This is where they've been the longest. This is Pohick, Dogue, and Little Hunting. So the bottom line is if you, are, if you want to catch snakeheads now, um, you kind of miss the heyday, at least in these creeks. Now, what happens is when they colonize new waters, you get the same abundant cycle, the same curve happens, and it takes about 10 years to hit the high point. Uh, so you've got time, obviously, uh, as these things colonize new waters, the population expands, it creates excitement and consternation, uh, and then, you know, it hits its peak due to exploitation and assimilation, and then the numbers decline. So that's where we are now. A quiet creek is not included here. It's a little further south. It was colonized later. It's a little more productive. Um, the numbers would be about twice in Aquia what they are here. So Aquia is still a good bet for those of y'all want to stay local. You know, Potomac Creek, Widewater, Aquia Creek, down there around Stafford County is probably a little bit better. Not to say you can't catch big snakeheads in Pohick or Doe. You still can. They're there. Uh, early in the season is best. When the dragons are out there because they haven't been exploited now, you know, for more than a half a year. They've kind of been left alone. People haven't been fishing for them. And uh, we always tend to see, you know, a, a fair number of big fish in our first, you know, month or two of samples, which we're getting ready to start here in a couple of weeks. So we'll be out on the water in the uh, second week of March. And, and, and then it's, you know, from there on out, it's, it's, it's all open. So, but, you know, April's always a good month. You know, the, the fish are real, March is tough for snakes. You know, the water's still cold. They're not real active. By April, they're starting to get pretty active. And the water temperature stays you know, in the mid fifties for an extended period of time, you, you, you finished with those cold fronts for the most part. And that's when the fish start to get active and you can still get some really big fish in, in even some of the Northern creeks. Um, okay, Jim, next slide, please. I just had a curiosity. Didn't you say that you did have some type of sampling when it came to snakehead in the middle of winter, which kind of uh, raised the question are they active during the winter months? Do they go into yeah. complete hibernation? Well, yeah, we, we've been back and forth with this in-house, sort of, amongst the snakehead, sort of, uh, gearhead, goobers. And um, <laughs> bottom line is, th there's no question they shut down. You know, whether you want to call it a true hibernation or not is open for discussion. That They shut down when the water gets real cold, for the most part. Now, we were out a couple of years ago for, for something completely unrelated to any sense of normalcy and stumbled in, in almost frigid water, barely above freezing, snakeheads out and about, um, weren't buried in the mud, doing their thing. And, and we still don't know what that was about. I mean, every once in a while, they throw us a curveball. And, 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 you know, well, just when you think maybe you're starting to figure some things out, Mother Nature likes to kind of, you know, throw you that, that slider or an off speed or something, and it just kind of mess, misses with your head. And, and so, you know, by, we haven't figured them out by any stretch. There's still a lot going on that we don't know about. And what those fish were doing, you know, in the mid to late January in water that was 34, 35 degrees, swimming around with carp and gizzard shad, I don't have any idea. Uh, and that was down at Quantico Creek where there used to be a heated discharge, but there's been no discharge there for about three years. So uh, that that's that's a mystery for the ages. Um, maybe someday we'll be able to tell you all about that, but I don't know. Roger that. Moving on real quick, uh, Scylla, and I'm going to go to the next slide. Scylla Johnson said, yeah, you will find them on warm water discharges. I've caught them in February, which gives credence to what you just said. All right. Um, so now what we're going to switch forward is a little bit of our bass survey in the tidal Potomac that we started in 2004. Because, gee, snakeheads showed up in 2004 and everybody was screaming that our bass population was going to be destroyed in, in the Potomac system. Uh, so we thought, well, we better start looking. And prior to that point, we didn't spend a lot of time in tidal systems. We spent a lot of time in small lakes and a lot of time in big reservoirs. Uh, but, but basically, tidal systems were overlooked. Um, so, you know, this is a good thing that we started getting involved. And, and obviously, they're extremely important. I mean, you think about the bass fishery. That, that the Potomac system supports, you know, the, the, the guides, the, the tournaments, um, and, and for whatever, you know, we just weren't that vested in it before the early 2000s. 
Uh, but we got into it pretty quick, and, and we've learned a whole lot since then. And we got into the Rappahannock about the same time as well uh, for different reasons, not because snakeheads showed up, but because the recruitment failures and the fishing was terrible. Uh, so we, we needed to figure out real quick what was going on. So, okay, next slide, please. And what this shows is since we, we arrived on the scene in 2004 and started collecting data, you can see those, earth, those first few years. This is basically a data point for every, every run, every survey we've had and catch rate and for total, catch per unit effort total. So this is fingerling or juvenile fish and adults. And what you can see is we've had upwards of 300 fish per hour in some of our samples. I think Jim might have been there on one of those days. And, and we've had some bad days, too. I mean, we've been down in some cases down near, you know, 10 or 15 fish an hour. Uh, but the bottom line is the trend is a good one. The trend is positive. Over time, we, we've had more bass in these tidal Potomac systems than, we've, than we had initially early on. Uh, and, and so this, the interesting thing about this is that, you, well, the, the same processes that, were, that drove the Rappahannock River to such a state in the mid to, in the late 90s and early 2000s probably manifest here on the Potomac as well. So you could argue that we're kind of starting from a pretty low space. Uh, so it might be fair to judge this upward trajectory just based on the fact that we haven't had those catastrophic events recently, except for 2018, like extreme dr droughts and extreme floods. Now, 2018 was the wettest recorded year in history. And gee, what do you think the spawn was like for snakeheads and bass and everything else on the river in 2018? It sucked. But you know what? It's not a big deal when you get one bad year class, when you've got three good ones behind it and three good ones in front of it. That's essentially what Mother Nature does. She throws you a bad one now and then. It's no big deal. It's a big deal when you have five in a row, which is what we had 99, 98 through 2002. Um, but anyway, right now, the times are good. Fish are reproducing. We've got good habitat. we got grass in most places. And that's why we see this line that we see. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, I just I, I threw some stuff on like Anna in there. We can just um, these are these are pure stripers and Anna we're stocking hybrids now, 50-50 uh, mix between the, the pure and the hybrid. Hybrids doing great. The water's getting Anna's a terrible habitat anyway for for pure stripers. So and not that we're phasing them out, but they're going to be reduced now. You know over time, the the the, the hybrid is going to do much better. So next slide, please. Every dam came out um i can't even remember what year it was it was a big deal what it was to restore passage for shad right that was the whole reason Embry dam came down um there was a lot of concern about what would happen to the, the river as a result of Embry dam coming down and so i think what i did again this was the rappahannock group and and, and they have sort of a vested interest in this but but some of this is important so I wanted to share with you all. So go ahead and, and show the next slide, Jim. And, and when I, we, you know, we've heard a lot. You all know about electrofishing. Most of, a lot of you have been out with me or seen me. It's, it's not a big deal when it's one boat. That's typically what we do. Uh, we call it a qualitative survey. We go out, we do our runs, and, and we get a relative abundance measure, which you just saw some of that in the catch per unit effort slide. Depletion electrofishing is a little bit different. And what, what we do in depletion electrofishing is we essentially send this gauntlet out of boats. It's inescapable for any fish to avoid to, to avoid us. And we so we have a section of river. We typically block it off with nets or, or there's a, a waterfall or some way the fish can't move in or out. And we, we run 10 or 12 boats through the whole section of river. We catch every fish in the, in the section that we can. And we put them in these giant pens or tanks. And then we do it again. And then we do it again. And we do it basically so there's no fish left. And then we do regressions. And based on those regressions, we get absolute numbers. How many smallmouth bass were in this 400 meters of river? How much did they weigh? And we can do that with every fish. And we know how, you know, how big that section of river was, what the flow was. And we know what the other section of the river was and the other section of the river was. So we can get averages. So we know an average number of smallmouth bass per kilometer or an average number of uh, snakehead biomass per hectare or, or however we're trying to look at something. We have this quantifiable 
analysis, which is different from the fish per hour thing, right? It's vastly different and more meaningful in many respects. So depletion electrofishing is one of the ways that we evaluated the removal of Embry Dam in Fredericksburg. So you've got this dam that's been there for over a hundred years. Fish have not been able to get back to spawn to their ancestral spawning grounds. And it's also kept non-native fish out, um, maybe for good or maybe for bad, depending on your perspective. So it's interesting enough, we, now we have three different depletion electrofishing surveys on the Rappahannock. The first one was the first depletion survey we ever did in Virginia, uh, which was 2001. Go ahead, next slide, Jim. And just an example of the holding tanks we have set up, pumping raw river water in. We've got about four of these tanks set up to hold all the fish in between runs, uh, and then we release them when we're done. Okay, next slide, please. And this was the, two, the very first survey we ever did in 2001, and my three-letter species codes here said that, that there's four dominant species. Two of them are native and two are non-native. The two native ones, the one in blue and the one in gold, are both suckers. White sucker, WHS, and northern hog sucker, NHS. So you've got about uh, what, 40%, 35% of, of the biomass. Now, this is not numbers of fish. I think biomass is, a, is, a, is a, a better way to look at it in terms of the overall contribution of these species. Well, what is the weight proportion of the total fish in that system? How much is, of that is made up by X? And so we have white suckers and northern hog suckers, a lot of biomass. And then we have these two non-native centrarchids or sunfish species, smallmouth bass, SMB at 21%, and redbreast uh, at 17%. So, but again, both of these non-native stocked in the 1800s. We think of them as native. They're, they're beneficial, naturalized species. They were probably pretty damn invasive, especially the smallmouth when it was stocked in the 1880s or whenever it was. Um, but they're here now. We love them. And um, we had plenty of them. Now, again, remember, this is biomass. Um, but and this was 2001. Okay, go ahead. Next slide, please. So the, the next depletion we had was 2010. Things look a little different in 2010. Well, all of a sudden, we have this gray cap, common carp, C-A-P. Common carp, before Embry Dam came down, you know, we had a lot of common carp in the Tyler River below Fredericksburg. But we didn't have them above Fredericksburg. Well, yeah, we do now. <laughs> so this is an average of three sites. Um, above Fredericksburg. One we call the Wayside, which was just about a mile above where Embry Dam was. The other one is Ely's Ford on the Rapid Dam. And the other one is at Clore Brothers or Mott's Run access on the, on the Rappahannock, which is about eh, five miles above the Wayside in Fredericksburg. So we got a buttload of common carp we didn't have before. And then we got these CCF things, channel catfish, we never had before. Um, <laughs> so all of a sudden now our biomass has switched um, to a 60, 70% oh, of fish that we didn't even have above Embry Dam before the dam came out. And so that's uh, so my friend Jack's coming back to me and he's saying, ah, smallmouth aren't going to fare well when you pull the dam out. Well, and now we're not, we're looking at biomass contributions. Now, what I would submit is that a lot of this biomass is additive. And meaning it, because of the Embry Dam being gone, we're now open up a conveyor belt of biomass and energy uh, from the tidal section of the river to what was you know, previously off limits. Uh, so what you don't see on here is, is a GZS, it's a little green wedge, but that's, that's um, gizzard shad. Okay, that's a very important dietary component for smallmouth bass that they didn't have before. So now you've only got 2% of the biomass of smallmouth bass. But in terms of the numbers, I'm not sure there's a hell of a lot of difference. And they're growing significantly faster at each age than they were before. So even though when you look at the pie chart and biomass, maybe it looks like the smallmouth bass took it a bit on the chin. In reality, it's not necessarily the case. Um, okay, go to the, the last one. The last depletion we did was 2017. And here, things may be starting to, to, to sort themselves back out a little bit. We still have an absolute ton of channel catfish. So the Rappahannock River has now become the Shenandoah River in terms of channel catfish fishery. And these are beautiful eaters. I, I, I used to float the Rappahannock a lot, do overnights with my buddy's kids. We'd, we'd do you know, camp cooking. You had to catch you had your dinner. You starved if you didn't catch your own food. So 
channel catfish was what we ate a lot. And, and most all the fish out there are one to three pounders, which are beautiful eating size channel cats. And I would encourage you to use them, uh, partake in them. They're, it's a, a beautiful, wonderful fish. Um, we still see the white suckers. And then look at the gizzard chad, 15% gizzard chad. Smallmouth bass still only 1%, but they're growing really well. And recruitment has been terrible lately for smallmouth bass. The last good year class was 2017. Um, we haven't had a good year class for smallmouth since then, and we had some pretty bad ones before that. So that's one of the reasons that the smallmouth numbers are so low in terms of biomass. But remember, that's not a numerical index. And our common carp numbers dropped way back to 5%. Now, in a minute, I've got a slide that sort of summarizes what, what might be, some of this might be attributable to. Okay, next slide, please, Jim. And now I'm just going to go through real fast some of these trends in, in major species that we saw. And, and these are the three depletions. And each depletion had the three sites above Embry, so there should be roughly three little circles for each year. Um, and, and these are this is this is not a significant decline in redbreast, but this is something we've been seeing in a lot of rivers. Are our redbreast sunfish populations declining a little bit? We're not sure why. We're not sure if it's significant. It might be related to the flows that are also impacting the smallmouth. But we're seeing redbreast numbers fairly stable, but but trending down a little bit. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> Channel catfish numbers, as I mentioned, this is a highly significant increase, obviously. Um, they weren't there before, and there's tons of them there now. Uh, and this is the, the x-axis of kilograms per hectare. So we're talking about, that's a lot of fish, a lot of catfish. All right, next one, please. This is the one that some of y'all may be interested in, the smallmouth. And so if you look at the three data points in 2000, we, two, we, were, we were benefiting there from some of the best year classes and spawns that we've ever had, 97. 97 was was the best ever. Um, I think I somebody said 2017 was 97 was the best spawn we've ever had. And I think what we see is is all that kilograms per hectare at that one site that was Rapidan uh, over 15 kilograms per hectare of of the 97 year class, which would have been like three year olds at that point. Um, that's what we're seeing there. But if you look the the last two years uh, we had it, uh, those data points on in 2017. I think there's, there's two that are covered up on each other right at the regression line. But, you know, that, that high one there, is, we're actually trending up a little bit in 2017 versus 2010. Um, so I, the, the, I'm not saying it's a great time to fish for smallmouth on the Rappahannock, but it's, it's not a terrible time either. Uh, there's some big fish out there. Okay, next slide, please. The other thing we've seen at the same time that some of the smallmouth numbers have declined, possibly due to spawning success in because of flows, but the habitat has changed not only in the tidal Rappahannock. We've got we've got hydrilla and SAV in the tidal Rappahannock we never had before. The non-tidal, it, we're covered up in hydrilla in the non-tidal section. So if you go around Clore Brothers above Fredericksburg, Mott's Landing, there is, th those big slow stretches are full of largemouth bass and hydrilla and snakeheads. Now there's a ton of snakes in there too. So anywhere you've got grass, as you all should know, you've got snakes. And so our largemouth numbers are way up. So again, it, it, to me, the Rappahannock is becoming more and more like the Shenandoah River in terms of the fishery with the channel cats and the largemouth. It's still decent smallmouth, but these other fish are moving in. Okay, next slide, please. Gizzard shad biomass. This is good for smallmouth bass foraging. Um, it's good for anything foraging. Um, that's forage. And we didn't have it before and we got it now. Okay, next slide, please. Common carp. They've, they've sort of sorted themselves out. Okay, next slide. And so why, why did this happen? Okay, I've already mentioned the very recruitment ad, ad nauseum. I mean, that's, that's the, even on reservoirs, variable recruitment is an important concept, but on rivers, it's, it's like the gold standard because it drives everything and it's so highly variable because it's a river. Uh, and if you don't have normal flows in the spring and early summer, you're gonna have a bad year class. Um, habitat changes, I mentioned the hydrilla, Sample site substitution, we did have to change that. Boat access on the upper Rappahannock is dreadful. It's nothing like the James or the Shenandoah. And, and because of that, we, we've had to change where we sample over the years. And of course, we've only, we're only talking about three sample sites. You know, the, those of the, you know, about, about stats and data, you know, the more samples, the better. And we're only dealing with three sites, you know, above the old Embry Dam. So that has a lot to do with it. You know, you can, you can swing um things just by one wacky year variability is high so that that really tends to throw a, a bit of a problem in your analysis if you're not careful
So that's all I've got on that talk. Does anybody have any, any questions on that one? Okay, so uh, real quick, John, I want to bring him back in. We uh, we did have a couple questions that came up. Uh, this one came from uh, Peter. Carp were there before the dam was taken out. You must hit a school of them on a ple depletion day. The catfish numbers are definitely much higher since the removal, though. Uh, any signs of blues above the fall line or flatheads? Okay, yeah, I, I do agree. I, I, yeah, I, I did make a misstatement there. I said about the carp. I, I, I lumped the carp and the channel cast together. We, we, we had seen carp before Embry Dam came down. There just weren't many of them in, in the big slow pool pools. There were some. We never did see a channel cat before Embry came down, but he is correct about that. Thank you. Um, with regard to blues, bl blues don't do well. That's not their preferred habitat. Um, flatheads, yes, if, if they were there, they would do well. We've never seen a flathead in the Rappahannock system. So there are no flatheads that we know of in the Rappahannock, and we hope to keep it that way. The blues peter out real quick. <laughs> no pun intended. Sorry about that. Um, they fade quickly above the fall line. Uh, we, see a, we see maybe one or two blues in that chlor pool with, you know, hundreds of channel cats. They just don't. That, that higher gradient and the rocky substrate and the boulders, that's not blues habitat. Blue, blues like the tidal river. Uh, the sluggish, sandy bottom, muddy, that, that's their thing, kind of like a snakehead. You know, snakeheads don't really like that habitat either. In, in the slower stretches with hydrilla, they'll tolerate it. Um, but I, th I think I hit his questions there. Did I miss one? No, I think you're good. Okay. Yeah, just a couple other side comments, but you're good. Let's go ahead and move on. All right, you want to do the Alabama bass? Uh, yes, uh, you should see the slides up. Uh, DEFCON 1, talking about my crop terrace, Samoitis, Alabama. Okay, yeah, and I think I did, uh, I might have I might have given you some bad info earlier, Jim, about the this, the, this, the Latin name of, of Alabama bass. Um, they're not Alabama, uh, that's the Alabama shad ends in Alabama. Uh, Alabama bass is, is her sholly, I think, but anyway, I think that much. Yeah, I appreciate um, you telling me that. You know me. Yeah. I'm a technical guy, so I like that. I appreciate yeah. it. Um, mm -hmm. But there is an Alabama shad, uh, so that my brain waves uh, fudge me on that. Um, I, I, so th this, wires, is the, right? th this is a talk that was given by Steve, uh, a number of different cases. He, he was also just published an article in the North American Journal of Fisheries Management, uh, which most of this information is in that paper and, and a lot more. If you're really, really into this kind of stuff, I, when that, that paper is about to be published, it, it'll be published online here in maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, I can get you a link to that. If it, it is interesting, I mean, it's, it's pretty technical, but if you're interested in it, I can absolutely share that with you. Um, and, and so I'm going to skip over some of this and just kind of hit the high points. So I'll be, I'll be changing slides frequently just because I don't want to bore you all with a lot of this stuff. And I, I, this isn't my talk. Um, I'm listed as a co-author, but I did not um, make this talk. Um, so anyway, um, the, the bottom line is Steve takes this very seriously, rightfully so, because we're and the problem is it, it, we, we just hosted a, a major meeting in Norfolk two weeks ago, three weeks ago. We, I was the program chair for it. We had over 200 abstracts and we had eight symposia and one of the all day symposia was Alabama bass introgression. And we had people, we had 500 people there from all over the Southeast. And, and, you know, a lot of them attended that Alabama bass symposium. And, and it was that big a deal that we had papers all day long. And, and, and that room was packed. We had to put them in a bigger room because it was standing room only among scientists. And that that's, you know, people are concerned about this. And, and this, this is the real deal. I mean, and, and the problem is we've lost a lot of our, 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 you know, we've, we've lost our credibility with, with you all and with, with many anglers because, you know, we've told everybody that snakeheads were so bad. And some people did. I don't, I don't think I ever did. But <laughs> um, be that as it may, you were told the snakeheads were bad and, and we haven't seen snakeheads be bad. And now we're telling you Alabama bass are bad. So why should you believe us? And Steve Taconis, who I know fairly well was, was going to write an article about Alabama bass. And I was talking to him on my drive to Norfolk a couple of weeks ago. And he was on some blogs and looking at some, some of the, the banter back and forth. And, and, and he just started laughing and he verbatim read to me, you know, why should we, they said snake is going to be bad. So why should we listen on Alabama bass? And I'm like, you know, Christ, we're screwed. 
So anyway, um, I, I'm asking you all to listen to me on this one because because I, I've seen the data, I've seen the papers, and I've talked to the, the scientists that have lived this. And, and you can't say that any of that about snakeheads. And nobody ever did that. Um, it was based on a comic book, for God's sakes. So um, anyway, uh, go ahead and next slide, please. <clears throat> Well, Alabama bass are from Alabama. Go figure. Their native range does extend a little bit out of Alabama, but into uh, neighboring states. One thing to mention here is that they're highly adaptable, the third bullet. They do occupy a wide range of habitats. They're generally, the bottom bullet is oligotrophication. That's a fancy word for nutrient deficient, maybe. So oligotrophic lakes are those lakes like you think of the Adirondacks, or you think of Lake Mumo. You think of colder, clear lakes. Uh, you can't see, you know, you can see almost to the bottom in any case. Those are oligotrophic lakes versus eutrophic is what we normally have, which have a lot of phytoplankton. It's hard to see in. You can grow a lot more fish. Eutrophic lakes are good for growing fish. You don't see oligotrophic systems at fish farms. Okay, leave it at that. Uh, but Alabama bass do really well. And, and if you start looking at these list of attributes here where they do well, it, it, it matches up pretty well with smallmouth bass, right? Because smallmouth are generally kind of a cool water fish we think of. And Alabama bass, even though they're from Alabama, which is further south, they do tend to favor these systems that are more reminiscent of smallmouth habitat. Not to say they don't do well in eutrophic systems as well, which we'll see momentarily. Uh, okay, next slide, please. These are patches uh, of increases in distribution through major time periods and what we can see in the upper portion in the purple 2020s that's us that's virginia um, we spent last year we collected almost 3,000 fin clips at a cost of i don't know forty thousand dollars or thereabouts submitted them to auburn university to get genetic analysis of all our major water bodies we found, unfortunately, um, some pretty scary things. Not only are Alabama bass introgressing with our black bass co-geners in southwest Virginia, as you see in the purple, purple blots there. That's kind of the New River and Claytor Lake. New River Base, uh, by the way, is where one of the few places in Virginia smallmouth are native. Uh, and we also see them now in southeast Virginia, the Diaskin Reservoir the James River, other places, um, we've got Alabama bass in regression as well. So it, we're in the infancy in Virginia, whereas North Carolina and some of the other states have been dealing with it for a decade or more. And, and, and that's why we're alarmed because of what they've seen. Okay, next slide, please. So what, what happens is in in eutrophic systems with largemouth is the, the primary predator or the primary recreational species, we see a displacement. So Alabama bass show up typically as a result of being Ill illegally stocked. Anglers like them because they're easy to, they're stupid. They're easy to catch. When they're new to a water body, they grow quickly until their numbers increase and then they stunt and grow very slowly. So what I'm fond of telling people is if you like going to fish in a bass tournament and like catching um, lots and lots of one pound bass, then Alabama bass are your thing. Go ahead and illegally stock them everywhere because you're going to end up with one pound bass everywhere. If you ever want to catch a larger fish, you can kiss that goodbye uh, because Alabama bass will take over and they will displace largemouth for habitat and space, basically relegate them to a minor role, if any. And, and, and that's 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 sort of the good side of it. The bad side of it is with smallmouth and spotted bass, they interbreed and thereby extinguish the population of smallmouth or spotted bass. They basically just breed them into complete mutts and then take over. So the percentage of, of, of alleles uh, of Alabama gets higher and higher and higher till they're the dominant allele in, in the population. Uh, so there's, there's essentially two two evil mechanisms here. There's a displacement and then there's an int genetic introgression. And they've both been documented. Okay, next slide, please. Um, 
Yep. Next slide, please. So this is um, this is a reservoir in Georgia. Another thing about this is, is what, when people illegally introduce Alabama bass, they typically introduce a, a blueback herring or alewives too. Um, <laughs> I guess they figure if you can illegally stock one fish, may as well add a, pre, a, a forage base, you know, to help it succeed. Um, cause that's, that's one of the keys that, that they started to figure out was when somebody only stocked Alabama bass shortly thereafter that they, they found river herons show up too. Um, I'm looking at the, the trends here. Go, go ahead. It gets, I, I don't want to get too deep into this. Go ahead to the next slide, Jim, please. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, real quick before I move on to the next slide. So I just finished at Lake Frederick and uh, I was talking to, with uh, Jason. Uh, you put me in contact with. Thank yep. you, by the way. Yep. Yeah. So they got uh, blackback herring there, but there's no Alabama bass. And so I, I guess my question is, is even if you did, <clears throat> even if you did have the capability to, to catch a bass and examine it and try to make an educated guess or a calculated decision on whether or not it was an Alabama bass, and you know where I'm going with this because I already know the answer. It's, it's very rhetorical. Can you look at a uh, an Alabama bass or can you look at a bass and say, yep, that's an Alabama bass versus a largemouth or spotted because they are yeah. species of spotted bass. There, 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 yeah. You can't, you can't do it, Jim. And there's a slide coming up later in this talk, I think that shows what the biologist pinned the fish as and what the genetics came back as. And we can't tell them. I don't expect y'all to be able to tell them and we can't tell them. Okay. We don't know. We, we catch when, when somebody catches a state record from Crater Lake and they say it's a spotted bass. We've got one right now. That's going under genetic analysis. Um, you can't go by anything. You can't look at lines or two patches or mouth or there's none of that works because a lot of times these fish will have five. They'll, they'll be they'll be smallmouth spotted Alabamas and, and and maybe even something else wrapped up in there. Um, there's just there's no way to know. No way. Um, the only way now if you have something that you just know is wrong, like you catch a fish and you're like, I know this fish is not you know not good. It's not right. Well, you know, kill it, take it home and eat it, but also take a fin clip of it, <laughs> put it, put it in an envelope with the location and the date and the size and, and get me, get, and we'll, we'll warn the genetics on it. Um, so, so that's an option too. But, but this, this is Lawrence Dorsey's um, data from Lake Norman, North Carolina. And this gets at what I was talking about with the displacement factor. So look at the, look at the bar graph for his catch rate. He had, you know, his catch rates weren't quite as high as ours in the Potomac on bass. You know, he only went up to 30 on the Y axis. But look what happened to it, a largemouth. I mean, basically, a largemouth are gone now. And this is this was a pretty major um, largemouth fishery, a, a eutrophic reservoir, you know, a lot like, say, Occoquan or Lake Anna. And, and look at the Alabama bass increase. Um, and, and so, you know, basically what's happened is the Alabama's displaced largemouth as the dominant black bass species here. Um, so, you know, that that's concerning. So the so the three takeaways that we have right now are that the Alabama bass, even though they are strong fighters, they are definitely not worth it when it comes to trying to catch, you know, really good fish. We're talking about citation sized fish, which is what we're aiming for when it comes to largemouth or the uh, Florida stream, the tiger program. Right. Uh, the other one is that you cannot just look at a bass that you're catching and say, yep, that's a spotted. Yep, that's an Alabama, because that happens very prolifically when especially when it comes to social media. Uh, you and I talked. I think it was a few weeks ago when uh, I was down in Norfolk fishing with some friends of mine. Someone had posted a comment and the guy had caught this bass and it was about a six pound bass. And he said, man, that's an Alabama bass. That's not a spotted, which I thought was pretty humorous because it, it gives credence back to what you're saying. Obviously, no one is doubting you, especially me, but it gives credence back to what the, the you know is factually based and scientifically based that you're not going to be able to look at a bass, uh, first of all, and determine what species it is. Second of all, uh, Alabama bass just don't get that big. And if we're, if, if we're getting to the point now where we're seeing a displacement for largemouth in place of Alabama bass, uh, there needs to be outreach. There needs to be something that really pushes that agenda to say, hey, listen, guys, this is the kind of things, these are the kind of things that we need to eliminate. And that's the uh, hearsay, uh, agenda listed items where people are making statements or, you know, there, there's declamatory statements based on supposition, inference, or, you know, just because of naivety or even negligence for that matter. So we want to stay away from that. Yeah, there, there's no way anybody can look at a fish and proclaim it's an Alabama bass. That dude's so full of crap. He doesn't know what's coming from. <laughs> 
So uh, real quick, uh, a comment coming out of Fish in the DMV podcast. How many years did it take at Lake Norman for the Alabama bass to become the majority population? Well, let me back up here. Uh, it looks like um, they, 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 they were trending along simmering until about 2001. And then by 09, so about eight years. Eight, eight, eight years, years from when when it really when they once they kicked it in. From the time they showed up, though, it was a little bit more. They were, they were discovered in 01, and they were dominant. Yeah, they were dominant in ten. So here you go. Yeah, nine yeah. years. Wow. Ten, ten. Okay. Uh, next slide. Yeah, that's Parkville, Parksville, Tennessee. Uh, yeah, Parksville Reservoir, Tennessee. Uh, next one, Carolina. Go one more, Jim. Yeah, Tennessee. Um, sim basically, the similar thing here, just a different state, different reservoir. Um, and small, the, the, the fifth, the fourth bullet, smallmouth bass eliminated. Uh, I, he, there, there's not a graph in here, one of the charts that show that. Uh, but again, no change or decline in overall black bass abundance. So this is another demonstrative that it, it, there is, it's not an additive theory here. What the, these Alabamas are, it, it's at the expense of either the large mouth or the small mouth, okay? It, it's, it's, it's not a brown trout in, in, in the Conway River adding to the brook trout biomass. It's, it's at the expense of, um, and I'm sorry, I just threw that out there, but um, anyway, so yeah, a, a, another example in a different state. Um, okay, next slide, please. Bar charts here looking at what, five different reservoirs, um, looking at the bass declines and Alabama bass increases. In most cases, we see a pretty good decline in largemouth and um, a pretty good increase in Alabamas. So nothing, nothing too surprising there. Okay, the next slide starts to bring us out away from the largemouth bass thing and into the smallmouth bass in regression. Hybrid, hybridization and regression pretty much synonymous for our purposes here. Um, go ahead, next slide with these bar charts. So Lake Gas in North Carolina, that is on the Virginia border. Um, so this is what I mentioned that the weak, the biologists can't tell. So when the, the red bar is, is what was identified in the field. So these biologists in Fontana Reservoir, North Carolina, they collected 50 fish and they said, uh, they're all smallmouth. Uh, but no, only 20% of them were smallmouth. 70% um, of them were half Alabama, half smallmouth. And uh, another small percentage of them were, were this it was screwed up mutt three-way thing. Um, in Lake Gaston, North Carolina, very similar. Um, these were all classified as spotted bass. And none of them were spotted bass. They were the Alabamas, Alabama largemouth hybrid. So the Alabama largemouth hybrids aren't overly common, but here we see it, 10% or so. Alabama spots, others, uh, and then pure Alabama. So in this case, the biologists couldn't tell the difference between a spotted bass and a pure largemouth. So it's not always that easy. Okay, next slide, please. So, so just so I understand it for everyone that's watching, the red bar indicates what the assumption was. Mm -hmm. The yellow bars indicate what the reality is. Correct. And these are confirmed. Okay, so what is the displacement timeline for largemouth as opposed to when Alabama bass move into that? And the second part of that question is coming from Peter. He asked, do they uh, do they stunt like that in their natural habitat as well? I'm assuming that back in Alabama. In other words, do they get just as big in Alabama? Are they only as big and in, in, in stunted? Or is it because of their habitat out here in Northern Virginia? Well, typically, whenever, whenever a, a fish is introduced outside its native range, to a novel system, typically at a very low abundance, okay, because in, in introductions aren't overwhelming usually. They're, they're usually a, a very few number of individuals colonizing a new system. Th there is a competitive advantage for that fish for the first few years, and typically that's when you will see larger specimens occur uh, until, that, until the, the abundance in the population gets up to a normal level. Uh, at which case the population will regress and you'll end up with either the, the, the normal size of it from its native range or potentially even smaller size. Um, so that that's what, you know, 
what we've seen or what, what has been seen and what we would expect to see. Um, you know, I, I don't know how we don't have we haven't surveyed average size of Alabama bass in Virginia at this point. So I can't compare with you what the average size of an Alabama bass is here versus anywhere because we don't have that data. But what about the displacement uh, timeline? So for for Alabama bass to, to for large against largemouth, are we talking, you know, is it is it a, a fairly expeditious process? Are we talking like a year, a couple of years? Does it happen overnight? Well, it, it, uh, these examples we just saw from uh, other states, Tennessee or, or North Carolina, it's about eight to 10 years for, for uh, replacement. And we don't know what's going to happen with the Tiger program yet because that still has yet to be determined well, I mean, because it's still, in, it's still in its infancy. We, right? we didn't even know we had Alabama in some of these systems and we, and we went out and surveyed them and we've got 20 to 30 percent of fish we thought were smallmouth are all screwed up. So we don't know how long that's taken. I mean, it could have been two years. It could have been 10 years. We don't right. have any idea. So if I recall correctly, that graph that you started with showed back in 2000, early 2000s, when it was uh, introduced to Virginia. And it had to be introduced. It's not like it could naturally find its way up here, right? Oh, no, absolutely. They, they were introduced purposely. Okay. And this, so that we're talking anywhere between 10 and 20 years. 20 years is what I think I saw for the timeline. Uh, and if we're talking eight to 10 years, as far as that kind of cycle, it, we really don't know. We know what's happened to largemouth, but we don't, we don't know what's going to happen with the Tiger Bass program, the F1 program. Well, you're, you're, yeah, I don't want you to, you're kind Confuse of confusing the things a little bit. Yeah. F, 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 F1 is, is the vernacular that's used for a, a largemouth bass, a, a original back cross between a pure Florida and a pure Northern. We're not talking about any of that here right now. We're talking about Alabama bass intergression with primarily smallmouth and spots. To a lesser extent, yes, largemouth, but that has nothing to do with F1s. Nothing at all. That that's a, that's like that's um you know completely separate. Got it. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we can the next bar chart, Lake Monticello, South Carolina, Monticello, South Carolina. That this is more of the same where the biologist wasn't able to discern um, in the field. You know, again, you know, I thought it was 100% smallmouth, but it wasn't. So go to the next slide and we see the consequences of Alabama bass introduction. And it's just sort of this bolded um, facts about largemouth bass impacted through competition. No, little to no genetic impacts. So that reinforces that aspect of it. Alabama bass replace largemouth and smallmouth as the dominant black bass species, not additive, except in certain circumstances. So that's important. Um, Alabama bass impact other native bass through hybridization more than competition. There we go. Last bullet. Extremely rapid, at least on an evolutionary scale, within 10 years. Okay. And... Last slide is one I did just for us. Um, and this was, I mentioned already, the couple thousand samples we sent in last year. We're going to be doing about another 500 this year. But we've, we've gotten enough baseline right now. And, and obviously, we can't you know, spend like drunken sailors every year on 10 zillion fin clips because we've got other stuff we need to spend money on too. But these are the systems where we know we've got Alabama bass genetic introgression now. Um, so I think that's my last slide on this topic. And uh, hopefully I answered, I hope I didn't confuse too many people with this, but and, and, and up with apologies, because obviously it's not my talk. So I didn't, I didn't compose all these slides and, but that's the best I can tell for you. Oh, you got another one up, Jim? Yes, sir. Is that okay? The, the yeah, last yeah, one? Yeah. Do you want to breeze through this one real quick? Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, are you, we'll are you following along with your own slide set? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the same thing. I can see. It's hard for me to see even my glasses on to see the, the, the chart on the phone. <laughs> it's because you're getting young. I got you. <laughs> uh, real quick, I do have a question uh, coming from the audience. This came from James Quinn. Hey, what's going on, with James? Uh, what fines slash punishments are in place for the people caught transplanting the fish species who is the best to report it to? What evidence do we need to prove they did it? And uh, thanks, thanks again uh, for the uh, info. And, and I, I already know this because I addressed this last time. I think it's 
stupid ridiculous that it's that low of an offense. Go ahead. Yeah. So we, we elevated. Th th there is a special class for that was for blue catfish, and we got snakeheads added to that. Alabama bass are not. They may be added to it this coming year at some point. Um, the special class is a class one misdemeanor, which is actually a fairly decent penalty. Um, it's a decent fine. It's got jail time. Uh, the, 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 old, the evidence we need is you almost have to have a confession or video, you know, photographic evidence, you know, um, the, the only, the only case that I've been associated with where, where we made a conviction and arrested a conviction was on somebody that posted on Facebook that he introduced snakeheads to Lake Brittle. And then when the game warrants went out and interviewed him and he admitted it. And so then they, they charged him with it. But that was before we elevated to a class one. So he was only charged with a class three misdemeanor, which is literally, I mean, they didn't even take his fishing license. They gave him a $50 fine, uh, which is, you know, that's, it's just ludicrous. Uh, so, but at least now with it, the snakeheads are class ones, blue cats are class ones. Hopefully Alabama bass will be class ones. Um, which has got a little bit more teeth to it. Now, there is the Lacey Act thing where if you're transporting fish across state lines, uh, you know, with the purpose of reintroduction, that is a serious, serious fine and jail time. So, you know, we, Lacey Act's a big deal. But a lot of times people are just staying within the state, so Lacey Act doesn't apply. Um, but anyway, the, the best thing you can do is just kind of shame people, you know, just, just moving fish is stupid, you know. Just kind of, you know, where's your conservation ethic? Where's your stewardship? You know, what are you doing? You know, you wake up, you know, just kind of slap them around a little bit. You know, just make them feel guilty. Make them feel like crap. But um, that's the best we can do right now, unfortunately. Um, but, yeah, so the best thing you do, you call me, call any. There's a hotline number. Like, we call it the, hot, the wildlife hotline number. Like, if you see deer poachers or whatever, it's the same number. It goes into Richmond. It's in every piece of literature we produce. It's a, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it, it, it's out there. It's Virginia Wildlife Crime Line, a hotline number, whatever you want to call it. And, and it's radio dispatched. And every call that comes in, because we're an accredited organization, it has to be responded to. So if you see something, um, you know, like when we're stocking trout and delayed harvest waters in Northern Virginia and people coming in behind us poaching and people bitching about it, I say, call this number. And they, they radio dispatch. Somebody will be here in half an hour. They have to. They have to respond. So if you see that happening, you know, call that number and just say, hey, you know, I'm here. I'm in, I'm at Lake Mooney. I'm at the boat ramp. And I just saw somebody dump a five gallon bucket in. This is your license number. I mean, and, and that's that's the best thing you can do. And, and um, you know, if we can't charge them, we're going to scare the hell out of them. God, God willing. I, you know, I think the two takeaways from this is that, you know, in my line of work, we, we have a saying and it's, you know, if you see something, say something. Right. I will tell you the same thing with this, but I, I, I will always say this whenever I have any kind of training classes. If you see something, do something, you know, make a report, call it in, take a video if you need to, uh, because the causality of all of this really is much bigger, much larger than what we're talking about by just showing charts and graphs. We're talking about an entire ecosystem that's being affected by this now, an entire state. And so everything that now we've seen over the last 10, 20 years, you know, look at the, the look at the causality of this and look how it's being affected. I mean, tonight is definitely a proof in the pudding for this. And so as a corollary, outreach needs to be implemented and it needs to be effective. It needs to be something that is tangible as far as the output that we see, you know, a few years from now, 5, 10, 15 years from now. Hopefully, anyway, uh, it will come to that. But I hope that answers your question, James. Thank you uh, for clarifying. Uh, John, appreciate that. Next slide. Yeah, so th these are, I'm sorry about this. I don't have any nice fish pictures in here. These are kind of boring. They all look the same. But I just want to run through these real quick and just because some of y'all fish these creeks. The, the, this is a sort of the this is the long term results I mentioned earlier in one of the other talks about how we're doing these annual surveys um, in these these core creeks on the P Potomac Tribs, and so the first one was Little Honey, and we see some wacky stuff going on there. Though we see some kind of wacky stuff going on here. Yeah, so L Little Honey, the, these first two creeks don't have any grass. Uh, Little Honey and Dogue haven't had any grass for about ten years, um, and I think a lot of that is due to the watershed. A lot of that is due to just the crappy habitat that these things take and, and the inability of them. A lot of it may be due to common carp. Uh, that's my personal opinion. There's so many common carp in these systems and they're always rooting around in turbidity. Like we'll go into Little Hunting Creek and it hasn't rained for two weeks in August and the water's just chocolate. It looks like a yoo-hoo, man. And it's just not right. And then you get up on the flats where the habitat should be for the snakes and the bass 
and, and you're just rolling like, you know, 30, 40, 50, 100 carp, you know, when you hit the pedal. And it's just, you know, I, I wish somebody could figure out what to do with all these damn common carp. Because for me, that's an invasive species that's causing a hell of a lot more problem than, than a blue cat or a snakehead or, or a lot of these other things that people are bitching about. But anyway, so Doe Creek, if you look at the y-axis here, you know, we're still Doe Creek's, you know, running about 50 to 70 fish an hour for largemouth and Doge. Um, uh, this is total uh, juveniles and adults, but you can see it's been stable. You know, it's not as cyclic as a little hunting. Go ahead to the next slide and we get the pohick. You look at my, so if y'all want to go kayak fishing for largemouth in the tidal Potomac, um, my, out of my, the core creeks, I, I would definitely say pohick's your number one shot. Um, the y axis here goes up to 300 fish per hour, and uh, Jim's seen some of this action, especially the last couple of years. Last year took a little bit of a hit, but you can see with those wide error bars. You know, these are line charts with, with, with confidence intervals or standard error bars on them. And so when you see the wider error bars, it just meant because each one of these years is based on, you know, like for Pohick, this is based on four, four samples, excuse me, six samples, two, two days, one day in April, one day in May, and each day there was three runs. Um, so that's six, six samples. So if, you know, if one of those days we had a, a really bad storm a day or two before and the water was really muddy and we couldn't see, and you know, you couldn't see the fish, then we caught fewer fish. Um, so that's when you tend to see those wider error bars. And narrow error bars are obviously much better in terms of uh, more precise data collection. And we like to see those the more, you know. But anyway, um, 2018 was that, was that really wet year. So we saw things drop a little bit there. But anyway, po Pokes, go ahead. Next slide, Jim. Pokes, Pokes is number one. Aquia, also not a bad choice further south. Um, things have been pretty stable there the last few years. Go ahead. Next slide. And this is just a fingerling catch for all my creeks. So what I just, I wanted to show you the variability in, in recruitment. And so a lot of times when people talk about recruitment, they're actually measuring the young fish, the age zeros or the young of the year which people will say, why, oh, why? You might hear that term. That just means that's a sort of a recruitment index or a way to gauge the spawning success. We're not doing that exactly with the largemouth in these systems because we're there in the spring. So essentially the fish that we're collecting are almost a year old. Um, and, and so we're basically categorizing any fish that's not an adult. And for us, that's eight inches. Um, anything less than eight inches it was last year's fish. And that, I think, is a very, very good assumption. And, it, and what it does is it's, it's been pretty accurate. And so if you look, it, it makes my heart feel warm when I see that dip in 2019. Okay, so 2019, we had the lowest catch of fingerlings for many years. And, but what did we already say happened in 2018? Oh, yeah, it was the wettest year in recorded history. Um, so it gives you some, some, some credence that maybe you're, you're collecting your data in the right way. Cause if you're not collecting your data in the right, right way, then why the hell are you out there? Right. You're wasting your time so anyway. Okay. Next slide. And we already seen a, a, a slide just like this one. We, we did take a little bump up last year, uh, due to Pohick. Pohick was back in the game with Reggie Bob likes to say, make Pohick great again. And, and uh, Lake Pohick was for the, we caught more fish. Pohick is one of the three core creeks. So Pohick is one of, that's the reason we took, hey, we had an uptick last year over a pretty substantial decline for the, prior to last year. If you look at the, the five years before that, that was a, that was an indictment on snakehead abundance in these creeks. Uh, but it did tick up a little bit. I don't think it's going to last, but there it is. All right, go ahead. Next slide, please. And. So what I did here was I just threw out some of your Northern Virginia top lakes. Uh, and this is based on largemouth bass catch rate in our single pass boat gear. And um, the last year it was shocked was, was in Occoquan was 2020. But I can tell you that that was the best survey of my entire career. And to this, since 2020, nothing has knocked Occoquan off the best bass lake in the state. And it's also, I think, one of the best. I have to send in these numbers to, to uh, Bass Times Magazine every year. And I don't think there's anything in the southeastern United States that's even close to the size of Occoquan, over 2,000 acres, that produces 11 M's an hour. That's 11 20-inch plus bass per hour. I mean, simply phenomenal numbers of large bass in the res in Occoquan. If I live near the res I, and I like to fish for bass, I wouldn't go anywhere else. And now you've got snakeheads there too. 
So you've got that water willow, especially in the mid lake region, well, even in the lower lake region too now. The water willow has grown up everywhere in so many of our lakes. It's just been a godsend for habitat. And, and I, you know, I just can't overemphasize, especially if you've got the spring doldrums from the rains and you, you can't get out on the tidal rivers. Um, and Mooney's obviously like gin clear and you're sick of dealing with that. You know, go to the Occoquan, man. This, you can't beat it. It is just phenomenal. Uh, Pelham. Pelham is phenomenal as well. And Culpeper, you need the little Culp- Culpeper Town permit, which is very, very cheap. Um, I would encourage you to go to Pelham because it has a ton of big bass as well. Uh, but you see where the, the Northern Virginia lakes stack up. If you have any more questions on that, feel free to, to hit me up anytime. And we will be out on a lot of these lakes this spring. So we'll have some updated information come um, early May. And on my last Just out, of, slide, out of curiosity, is it because it's eutrophic? All these lakes are eutrophic. Every lake on there. And I call leader, Pelham, Germantown, Burke. Yep. Every lake is classified as eutrophic. Outstanding. And uh, just to make sure that it, is it Germantown or Pelham that has the double digits in it? I think it's Pelham, right? It has the double digits? Uh, I'm sorry, Jim, yes. what? Big bass. Uh, double digit bass. Aquaquan. Yeah, big bass. Aquaquan. Double digit bass? We're talking about 10 plus pound bass. Oh, oh, oh. Um, the only place I've seen 10 pound plus is Germantown. Not Pelham, Germantown. Germantown. Okay, okay. So and, I, and I, I, and then, I, so I, I want to point I, yeah, that was that was stocked more recently, and I believe when it was initially stocked, it was with pure Floridas. Before we figured out that pure Floridas didn't do that well in, in Virginia, but the the net of that was we still have with all the mutts in there now, we still have a higher percentage of Florida alleles. So even though it gets stockpiled and there's a lot of small bass and they'll grow well, we do have some monsters. Got it. Got it. And just uh, just as a uh, uh, a quick clarification, this is what you're doing when it comes to electrofishing, not citations that are caught, because that's a completely separate category. It's a completely separate separate set of rules as far as uh, what we're actually measuring. So um, I want to make correct. sure that we clarify. Yep. Just because they're there doesn't mean they're biting. <laughs> correct. That's correct. Yep. All right. And this is my last slide, my plug on Anna. Um, times are good at Anna. I mean, really good. And they're only going to get better because we're right in the middle of six years of stocking F1s in the mid-lake region. So if you want to go to Anna, go to the state park, fish right there at the splits, fish Ware Creek, fish bottom end of Rose Valley, um, Stubbs Bridge area. It is phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, the, the bags just keep getting bigger. And, and that's even without the F1s. I mean, the F1s haven't shown up. They're not eight pounds yet. Um, you know, they might be four but the, the first year, but, but they're not eight. And so we're, we're already seeing, and it was already trending great. It didn't need the F1s to be honest. Uh, I just went along with it sort of as an experiment, <laughs> but um, it, it, you know, I, I just can't overemphasize how great and is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's smoking right now. So. Yeah, Ed has done a really well, uh, done very well for uh, a lot of the anchors out there doing the winter bass tournament events. But I, I don't know if you, I, I, I sent you the photograph of this. It was the Dirty Thirty, as it was dubbed. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah that was just a couple yeah, so, weeks ago. So the, the 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 two the difference in these two graphs, the one on the left is, is catch per effort total. So that's a total bass caught per hour. You can see it. We're up around 150, which is you know more than than the tidal Potomac or the tidal Rappahannock. And the the graph on the right is is catch of memorable fish. That's a 20 inch and over. Um, and, and so you can see that's not quite as a, um, a compelling regression. Like if I was to do an R squared on the, on the graph on the left, especially if I took that one outlier out the year our box was acting up, I mean, that would be an R squared of like, you know, 0.9. Um, the one on the right's not nearly as significant, but, but I mean, it's amazing that relationship. So that's all I've got on slides. Um, if anybody has any more Roger questions, that. I'll try to, try to help you out. Okay, so uh, we do have a question come from uh, Peter Flottenhauer. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Uh, I already know the answer to this. What about the small <laughs> lakes like Mott's or Hunting Run? Don't you ever say that word again. You can never ask that question again, Peter. <laughs> ever. So he was asking specifically about Mott's or Hunting Run? That is correct. Yeah, so so Mott's, like if, if you go to our webpage, there should be updated or not updated, um, we're trying to keep things updated, biologist reports or sampling reports for all lakes in our work area, including lakes that you just mentioned. Um, Honey Run was getting sampled every year for a long time because it was screwed up. And, and by that, I mean it was it was predator heavy. 
it, it got off on the wrong foot, kind of like Mooney did, <laughs> except we never stocked Mooney with bass, which makes it even more compelling and extraordinary. <laughs> really? Yeah. Really? Um, but honey run got off it, bass, bass heavy to begin with. And <laughs> thank you. And, um, Hi. <laughs> and yeah, so, um, the, we, we hunting run was the repository for every bit of surplus forage our hatcheries produced year after year. We removed bass, we added forage, and then we went nuclear. It's only in my entire career, we've only put gizzard shad in one water body purposefully, and that was hunting run reservoir. And between everything we did, um, that fishery finally turned around. And, and now I would not classify it as predator heavy anymore. It's kind of off and running. And so because of that, we've dropped our sampling back because, you know, when, when we're doing our surveys, as I mentioned, if we're not collecting our data and getting efficient, non-biased estimates, why are we doing it? And we've only got about a three week span where we, we've got and we can't fit everything we want to do every year in a two to three week span. So we have to pick and choose what's most important to get data on. And so because Honey Run was doing much better, it got relegated to a, a larger sequence in terms of surveys. Um, so we haven't been, I think we might have Honey Run the schedule this year. We haven't been there in a couple of years, but it was doing much, much better. Um, thank you so much. And then on Moss Reservoir, Moss went through a bit of a rough time too, about 10 to 15 years ago. I think it had an outbreak of largemouth bass virus, although that was not documented. But I know we overstocked grass carp and completely denuded the lake of all aquatic vegetation, which was bad on me. And I will never do that again. Um, but we've seen that bass population recover to a large extent as well. And the last time we were there, Moss was ranked pretty high. In fact, I can bring up, give me a moment, and I will bring up the rankings and I will tell you exactly where uh, those two lakes ranked in the district in the most recent surveys. Are you talking about honey run as far as uh, citation or uh, member pools? Um, I normally do it. I used to do it by, oh, that's not what I wanted. Um, I might do it. I used to do it by. Uh, citation P's is number 15. three. I used to do it P's, which is 15 inch and over. But then, especially between you, Jim, and a couple other folks that were always trophy hunting, I got to thinking about, well, who cares about P's? 15, 15 inches, 15 inch. I want a big fish. So I started ranking stuff by M's. Um, okay. So, so while you're doing that, I'm going to show this one bass. I want you to look at the size of this bass. You can't really tell because I can't pull it up on my, uh, on my computer. But this is that big, big, fat bass. This is a nine-pound bass that was taken just uh, south of here from a good friend of mine, Robert Brown. And let me tell you, to measure only 20, 21 inches, and be nine pounds, it gives Cretus back to why the tidal basin is the way it is, where you have these, you know, big, fat, stumpy bass, especially when it comes to being so eutrophic. And I think you said it before when we were having uh, previous, uh, uh, we were having previous uh, conversations about this, especially when we were doing our, our uh, video podcast here. It was talking about how eutrophic it is because the bass are feeding and they're doing so well on all the flora and fauna there uh, that they just outgrow, they grow very, very quickly. They have an accelerated growth, growth rate. Uh, we got a couple of questions here. So, so Mots was last surveyed in 2020, and we had 35 P's an hour, which is pretty good. And we had four M's an hour, which is pretty good. Um, so Mots, Mots was not fantastic, but it was very solid. Um, Hunting Run was a little further down the list. Um, it had 29 P's an hour and four M's. So that's still pretty good for M's for, for those 20 inch and over at hunting run. That was last survey 2021. Um, four, so four and four on both lots and hunting run. So those are still legitimate destinations for, um, you know, a, a, a citation bass. I think we're good then. Uh, he said, I've seen the ranks on the website, but was wondering if we had any updated info. And I think that's pretty much the most up to date and current information. They do a pretty good job about keeping DWR's website up to date. So uh, I definitely yeah. agree with you. Uh, last but not least, and I know we're out of time because we're right at the uh, 90 minute mark. Uh, when it comes to the striper bass and the hybridization of striper bass, Lake Anna, uh, I think you said before, talking about possibly a state record coming out of Lake Anna in the near future because they're getting of, so big. Of, of the, hy the, the hybrids that we stopped, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. 
How big? How big? You expect it? How big? How big is the state record? I knew you were going to ask me that. I guess I always have to write it down. <laughs> I don't I know. Forget. It, it's it's from Clater Lake. Um, Christ, Jim, I don't remember. It, um, we're not that far from it right now, but I, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember. Okay. I, I, fair enough. Fair enough. All right, brother. So uh, anyone out in the uh, audience, anyone watching, if you got any questions, you got about 30 seconds to post something up. We don't want to keep uh, too much of John's time. He's been very gracious enough to give us the last 90 minutes of his time. John, anything you want to close with? No, thank you all for listening. Appreciate it. And reach out if you have any questions. I'll try to answer them if I can. Roger that. Hey, as always, everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to tune in tonight, John. Love you, brother. Thank Seriously, you, after everything that you do, thank you so much for taking the time to walk, talk to us. Uh, Nathan Cross coming from out in the audience. And hey, great information. Thanks for this, John. Uh, for those of you watching, if you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and post it on our website. Uh, we can, I'll personally reach out to John if need be. Uh, John, if you don't mind, go ahead and stay out for about 30 seconds after I go ahead and end the broadcast. Other than that, for everyone out there, thank you so much. Remember to conserve, spread the word, and remember 22 a day is 22 too many. For the rest of y'all, have a wonderful evening. Thanks again.